Welcome into the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM, the king of sports books. We're here for another UFC betting preview, UFC Vegas 89. I'm your host, Brendan Glasheen, joined by the usual crew this week, Sean Zarillo, Billy Ward. It's time to get to best bets. We'll go to the main event. The guys have their fight of the night they're targeting, favorite underdogs, some props, and then a best bet, final bet. We'll figure that out once we get to the end of the show. Uh, before we get started, the quick heads up, the great state of North Carolina officially launched sports betting last week. So if you're in the Tar Heel State, take advantage of the best sign-up offers across every sports book. You can find a link to every one of those offers in the description of this episode. All the North Carolina offers, all in one place. Just check out the link in the episode description. Audio, of course, on wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we're live on the Action, not live, but we have the Action Network YouTube channel as well for a video version of the podcast. Please subscribe and like the video. All right, gents, let's dive in. The main event featuring Amanda Hebus and Rose Namayunas. What do we like this week, Zarello? How do you break down the fight and how would you like to bet it? Yeah, Billy and I both on the underdog side of this matchup. I think we do agree that Hebus has the submission or dominant control grappling upside and a plus money and across a 25 minute fight i think she does get rose down at some point either threatens the submission or holds control for extended time rose does not have good takedown defense 60 percent across her ufc career seen her get put on her back not only put on her back though but held there for long stretches she tends to close her guard and she's comfortable kind of waiting out the round on her back she's the much better striker in this matchup technically but in terms of volume i think rebounds can actually pull ahead over the course of 25 minutes the main concern on the Hiba side is cardio and the fact that she hasn't tested it across 25 minutes before. These are two former straw weights now fighting up at 125 at flyweight. Namahunas never had the best cardio at 115. And maybe fighting at 125 now, her gas tank is a little bit better, but her output and her effectiveness tends to wane in the later rounds of fights. She's proven that across multiple 25 minute fights now. He must is typically building later on in her fights and getting better in the third round and adding on volume in the third round and building. So while she never has been 25 minutes in her career, the pace that she's keeping, the momentum that she has at the end of her fights leads me to believe that she is going to have pretty sufficient cardio to get through a 25 minute fight. So normally I'm automatically targeting against these fighters who have no main event experience, no five round experience in their first main event, especially when they're facing a fighter in another main event that has five round experience. But I think given the cardio dynamics we've seen for both fighters in the fat in the past, at worst, I think this cardio is equal. And if not, would favor Hibas in that department. So more grappling upside, potentially more volume across a 25 minute fight, and then maybe better cardio too. have to take Hibas here at plus 190. I think there's a chance that Rose can knock her out early catch her. She's the much better boxer. She hits harder, but I think Hibas has, as I said, all the grappling upside. And then I guess my other concern, too, is just maybe the, the mental state of Hebus. She's talked about wanting to fight for a BMF title in the future. And you don't fight for a BMF title trying to control people on the ground or submit them. You fight for a BMF title slugging it out of the feet. And that's not really the type of fighter she is. She doesn't have huge power in her hands. She's not like this electric boxer, or, you know, electric combination puncher. But she does put out a lot of volume. And I think that could put her head on the scorecards if this one does reach a decision. So... Billy, I'm, I'm sure you have pretty similar thoughts, though, with regards to the grappling specifically. Yeah, the grappling's obviously huge. You know, I'm always a sucker for the double black belt. You got the judo and jiu-jitsu black belt. Been training, like, since she was in diapers or whatever with her dad, who's a fairly well-known grappler himself. But the other thing, and it's not even really so much of a technical analysis or whatever, because you nailed that, Zerillo, but I don't know that Rose wants to be doing this anymore. Like, since that, you know, fight against Wiley, or, um, Esparza, where she kind of didn't really engage and could have gone her way, but nothing really happened. So, you know, can't be mad about that. Comes back, took like a year and a half off. Didn't look super engaged against Fioro. Better. You know, she was trying out there, but it still didn't seem like she wasn't the thug Rose of old, where she was really out here aggressively hunting stuff. She was kind of just point fighting, dancing around, doing her thing. Can be kind of effective, kind of not. And then on the other side, he was in her last fight, we saw her like really open up with some striking for the first time in her career, you know, lands a spinning wheel kick, follows up on the ground, picks up her first UFC knockout. So it's, you know, you nailed a lot of the technical stuff. I don't worry too much about cardio with these lighter weight classes, just because even when they do get tired, their version of being tired is nowhere near like, you know, 265 pound men being tired. It's, it's still, you know, they can still operate a little bit. So I'm not super worried about that. Uh, Hebus is three losses in the UFC. Two of them were at flyweight. 
I know this isn't flyweight, so in theory that seems like a bad thing, but Rose isn't a big flyweight by any stretch, you know, former strawweight herself. So I think not being so much smaller than her opponent helps Hebus here. Hebus actually has an inch or so in reach, which not a huge deal, but she's not massively undersized like she sometimes is. So, yeah, I'm kind of surprised at the price we're getting. It was plus 205 or something on Sunday or Monday. I just – the technical stuff matters, but if you don't want to be here and you don't want to be fighting anymore, Trevor Whitman's not going to be in her corner again, which worries me for Rose. There's just so much of that outside of the cage stuff that I can't bet on Rose, and I think it's a perfect fade opportunity. We This could be the downfall. I know they're about the same age, but we might have seen the best of her already, and she's it's just, if you don't have it anymore, you don't have it, and there's nothing wrong with that, but – Obviously not someone we want to bet on in those circumstances. Hebus is 30, Rose 31. Is there a situation where either of you might come in on Hebus if it doesn't go well early? Or do I counter and say pre-fight if the price comes down on the money line for Hebus? Is there an angle for the other side possibly just for the audience? Given the fact that she's never been 25 minutes, it is difficult to like justify the live bet because, as I said, we're, we're sort of projecting her cardio based on mm-hmm. how she's doing at the end of her 15-minute fights across a 25-minute fight. So I think it's 50-50. I think the scenario in which I'd bet Hebus is she loses like the first four minutes of round one striking, and then she mixes it up and goes for a takedown at the end of the round and hits it. And you're like, okay, she, she has that in her back pocket. She can hit the takedown when she wants it. So... Yeah, I think if her price blows out a little bit after round one or after round two, but she's shown that she can hit a takedown and control Rose for a little bit, but that doesn't necessarily win her that specific round. I think that's where I'd want to enter is is showing, proving that she can get the fight to the ground, but not necessarily winning the fight to that point. Okay, let's go to the fight of the night. We've got Talbot and Simon, the matchup in the Bantamweight. Uh, taking a look at the price right now over at uh, BetMGM, you can find... Uh, uh, Cameron's about a, a slight dog, and yet Talbot is the favorite. Same question. How do we assess the fight, uh, generally speaking, Zerillo, and then what angle might you want to take uh, to bet this fight? Yeah, as a banger, this is very similar, you know, in terms of trajectory of these prospects for the Christian Rodriguez and Isaac Dolgarian fight last week. I love these type of fights. I love seeing the UFC pair off some of their top prospects and letting them go out it. Uh, Peyton Talbot getting a lot of Sean O'Malley comparisons just because of his size, the division the length, the physique, throws a ton of volume. He is the taller and longer fighter in this matchup, two inches taller, three inches longer. But I think Saman is the more proven prospect. And I think Saman also has the grappling upside in this fight. I don't think he's going to necessarily make use of it or even successfully be able to deploy it. I don't think he's going to be able to control Talbot for long stretches. But I do think there's a chance that Talbot... Because when Talbot gets up, he tends to give up his back. So I think there's a chance that Salmon can lock in a body triangle, win a round that way, and then win another 50-50 round and eventually pull out the fight. My other concern with Talbot, too, even though he is taller and longer, I don't think he makes as much use of his length as a guy with that size, like O'Malley, who you'd expect him to. He actually prefers the box of the pocket, be much closer to his opponents, and that tends to favor Salmon, you know, the shorter fighter, if they're going to be fighting in closer. So... I think this is going to be really competitive. I think it's going to be really close. I think it's going to be fought at the pace where you'd expect one of them to get finished. I think it's going to be super high paced, but I think they're both super durable. And ultimately it goes to a close and competitive decision. So I lean to Samen. I lean to the over. I'm probably not betting this fight. There seems to be one of these like flag planting fights every week where everybody just wants to be on one side or the other and, you know, choose their fighter. I don't really feel a need to jump in on those fights because I think oftentimes people are projecting, you know, their opinions onto the fighter where I I think the line is probably about right here, ultimately, uh, given the size advantage, but it's, this is just going to be a war and I probably don't want any money on it. Maybe either fighter by decision would be the way I would poke it just to have, you know, a nice juicy plus money prop for one of them who I expect to ultimately win by decision, but likely a pass for me. I think Billy is more of a preference on a side though. No, I'm definitely taking Peyton Talbot here. There's a couple things. He's somehow taller and longer, but also the bigger, stronger fighter, if you look at them physique-wise. I'm not sure how Talbot makes 135. Like Much like Christian Rodriguez, who we just saw beat Simon while missing weight and then jump up to 145. I don't know how long for bantamweight Peyton Talbot is. It just If you look at him, it doesn't look like this should work. The big thing I saw technically is he does a really good job fighting orthodox against lefties. And we saw that in his UFC debut. He's always winning the front foot battle. 
He's not trying to jab, you know, into that short hand the way a lot of guys do. He's leading his attacks with his rear hand and his rear kicks. He's got really good kicks. I see your point about he does get in too close and doesn't use the range as well, but he has really good knees and elbows in there, so he kind of at least counteracts that. And then on the grappling side, when Talbot gets control, he's prioritizing position, looking to land damage, and then he'll go for some stuff. Simon, if you watch him grapple, he's got some takedowns in his arsenal, but he'll kind of take some bad risk looking for submissions, where if it doesn't work out, then he gives up the position. And that's cool against lower-level competition. Once you start fighting these tough guys who aren't who you aren't going to hit the sub on, you don't get that all of a sudden you're in a bad spot. And I know that in theory, Simon has more UFC, or not in theory, he has more UFC experience. In theory, he's more tested. If you look at these guys' records, I don't know how true that is. The guys that Simon beat are two and five in the UFC. Both of those wins were split decisions by Mana Martinez. So like he could have easily fought three guys without UFC wins until Christian Rodriguez, who beat him. Peyton Talbot, the only fight of his career against someone with the overall losing record was his debut. He fought a fellow debutant, and they've given him tough fights this whole time. Nick Aguirre, you know, not the toughest UFC debut, but, like, in the broad scheme of things, he's been tested a little bit. Despite less UFC fights, he's a little bit older, a little bit more polished. I don't love the price at minus 150 or so, but I kind of don't see how Simon gets this one done. I don't think he gets the takedowns. You know, Talbot's defended, like, 90% of the takedowns he's seen across uh, Contender Series and his UFC debut. Don't love that he gave up all that control time in round one, but he's still getting better. And that's against a guy who really wanted to grapple, where Simon kind of uses grappling as a as a backup plan. So I'm not as worried about that. I think this ends up mostly being a striking match. You got one guy hits a little bit harder, a little bit more creative, and then he's fighting the lefty Simon, and he's just done a really good job in that exchange. So those are the technical reasons for me. And then outside of that, I've always felt like I've bet Simon a lot. It kind of felt like he kept getting away with stuff early in his career. Like, it was like, oh, that didn't look good, but he figured out how to get a win. Or, you know, he slipped up or gets a majority decision against Mana Martinez. And I feel like that shoe's kind of dropped where maybe he's not the prospect we think he was. And this is going to have Talbot kind of take his place in that prospect pecking order. And Talbot does have the uh, three and a half inch uh, reach advantage. And then as Rillo noted, the the height differential, 5'10", uh, V5A Talbot. Yeah, he's uh, going to look a weight class bigger. And I think the power differential, that, I think that's what ultimately pulls him ahead. You know, close and competitive decision, but he's going to land the harder shots and judges score on damage now. So I think just likelier he's landing the biggest punch of each round. Uh, and, you know, the, the Aguirre fight, um, that's really sticking with a lot of people because Talbot lost that round when unanimously completely controlled him on the ground. Simon's not going to control him for that long of a period yeah. of time. I think any grappling exchanges here are going to be super scrambly, and then they're going to return to the feet and go back to striking. So, yeah, it's just it's one of those fights where, like, I lean to the dog because I expect it to go over. I expect both guys to land 100-plus strikes, and then you're kind of banking on the judges, like, leaning your way, but ultimately Talbot has the power advantage. So they probably go his, his direction in terms of damage. And the scrambling you mentioned, that's kind of my point about how Simon likes to grapple. And I think you see this a lot in guys. Honestly, a striking is kind of a similar dynamic where they do kind of gimmicky, flashy stuff. And against lower level competition where you're just a better athlete and better trained and clearly better, that stuff's great. You know, he's knocking people out with spinning back fists. He's diving for weird submissions and winning that position. But now you're in like a dogfight against another guy who's not going to let you get him with that stuff. It's just not a great way to win minutes from Simon. Like he's going to have, I put, I did the breakdown of this one in a full article. And I said, I think Simon's got the potential for some really big moments here and there but he's not a guy who's going to consistently like be winning at any given point in the fight. And it is striking and grappling are both similar in that regards. And that's a great way to crush lower level competition and put together a highlight reel, not a great way to fight against other, you know, similarly talented fighters. Yeah. I think Samen's a better matchup for Samen is not a guy who throws a hundred strikes, like not a guy who throws a ton <laughs> of volume, you know, more of a, a one strike power puncher where he can not get knocked out because he's durable. But yeah, fighting, fighting a guy who's like employing a similar, volume is you that probably goes against Simon's best competition so okay so for Zerillo this is more of a fight he's just curious to watch you got two young bucks going at it 25 and 23 uh Talbot and Samen going head to head in the uh, bantamweight all right let's go to uh favorite underdog for the weekend no cons- uh do we have a consensus underdog this week we have won yeah uh that would be depending uh, on what you want to call him or the, the site that you're looking at, the UFC is calling him Igor Severino, but on a lot of betting sites, you will see Igor De Silva. Uh, so just make sure to 
look out for the potential name differential depending on where you're betting it but his first name is igor his last name will either be severino or silva depending on the website uh this is our consensus underdog another fight between two really young guys 20 and 25 years old respectively his opponent is a kickboxing champion severino is the more well-rounded martial artist and i just generally am going to pick the more well-rounded fighter at plus money it's also not like he's 20 fighting a 28 year old or a 30 year old he's fighting another young guy who is coming off of a kickboxing career and does not have you know established ufc experience against guys who can actually grapple and mix it up so uh both debutants you know just taking the plus money essentially on the guy who i think has yeah. the grappling upside billy can break that one down further but we are head to head on a couple bets on this card including okay. both of billy's best bets so my favorite underdog in this card uh is cody gibson now he's an older random weight 36 years old but Miles Johns is a guy I typically bet against because I think he has bad cardio, and he's coming off of a fight where he showed great cardio for the first time in his career. I was like, what the hell is going on here? He popped for Tyranobol, popped for steroids, and was suspended after for six months. He's coming back from that suspension now, taking this fight on short notice against the guy who has better cardio than him. So I probably like Gibson more live after round one than I like him pre-fight, but I just think Gibson is going to land more volume across 15 minutes. And I think he wins the third round about as consistently as Johns wins the first round. And I think that second round will be the turning point. So getting plus money on Cody Gibson in a fight that I think is just going to come down to the cardio. Happy to take that. I know Billy's against me in that fight. Uh, and I would imagine it's partially because the age differential and partially because how Johns looked in that last fight. But I, I have serious skepticism about Johns performance, career best performance for me in his last fight, considering he immediately popped for steroids after. So very interesting dynamic uh, coming off of that suspension. But, you know, I, um, if you were to average, right, like taking other sports, you're going to take a career average of performances. You're not just going to look at that last performance. You may, you may weight that last performance a little bit more heavily, right? Like if a uh, starting pitcher in baseball, you know, last performance is like the best he's had all season, but you're still going to take somewhat of an average of career stats. And the average of Miles Johns across his career is that he fades at the seven and a half minute mark. So I'm banking on him regressing to that mean. We've seen fighters overperform in the past in cardio, and then in the next fight, they tend to regress towards their career average. I think you can have a good night, uh, and I think there was a reason he had that good night, but <laughs> willing to take a shot against him. Though. Okay. Uh, as a reminder, Billy Ward's got uh, his article up. He puts this out early in the week, UFC Luck Ratings up at actionnetwork.com in the Action app. And why don't we start there, Billy? We'll get to De Silva, but hit on Miles Johns and why you believe he's actually undervalued as the favorite in this fight. You're going against Zerlo here. Yeah, no, he's got me fired up to talk about this PED issue. All right. um, so first of all, that was last year when USADA was still a thing. Um, the amount of performance-enhancing drugs found in his system it was caught by the State Athletic Commission. It was not caught by USADA. And then the State Athletic Commission since then has actually raised their threshold to the point that John's current test wouldn't fail. Now we don't have USADA. The State Athletic Commission has raised the amount. Who's to say he's not using the same amount or more of that now? Like, of, of course he is, actually. I'm going to say he probably is. Why wouldn't you be? There's less testing now than there was six months ago. Uh, so that's my point on that. I am not worried about these guys coming off overturned wins due to PEDs in this post-USADA era. Other thing, uh, you talk about looking at their career average or their career average performance. For Johns, that's a 4-2 and two UFC record, not counting his win that was overturned, which would make him 5-2. and two. Cody Gibson is 1-4, and four, one of these guys coming back in from the, uh, from the Ultimate Fighter. That season of the Ultimate Fighter was horrible. It was filled with a bunch of guys that the UFC didn't think was good enough to be on the Contender Series. It's like we're down to like double A baseball. And yeah, he won a couple of fights on the house. I don't really care. He's one and four in the actual UFC. That's not a great look. Again, being 36, the age is part of it. So yeah, I just think I used to do exactly what Sean's saying. And when a guy had a win that later there was some drug testing, I'd discount him after that. USADA's gone, guys. We're not doing that anymore. When we think a guy might be willing to cheat, that's a reason to bet on him, not against him in these days. And if you get a win, and your bet pays out, and two weeks later they overturn it because they found something in a sample, they don't take that money back. Right. So not worried about the performance enhancing drugs issue. Don't think Gibson, and then the other guy I'm going to mention in my best bet, which is also against Sean, I just don't think those guys in that season ultimate fighter are worth much of anything. So that's the big part of this. But, you know, the drug issue is is one as well. Okay. 
Here's your response to that. Now, you're on the same side, though, as it pertains to De Silva. <laughs> I, I totally you forgot. I was so man. fired up to talk about. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, yeah, no, it's – Sean nailed it with all that. Like, we don't really know much about either guy. One is more of an MMA fighter. One is more of a kickboxer who just put on small gloves. We're in a little cage. There's a lot of ways this could go. They're flyweights. I think Severino, despite being more of the well-rounded fighter, also seems to hit a little bit harder. You know, he picked up a knockout two knockdowns to get to a knockout in his contender series fight. Lima won by decision against a guy who didn't really look UFC level. Part of that was because the other guy Hickson was running away from him. So I'm not totally faulting him on that, but if these lines were reversed, I would take Lima plus money too. It's just kind of a structural thing. Two undefeated prospects, young guys, relatively similar fight styles, broadly speaking, one of them's plus plus one fifty, one of them's minus one eighty or whatever. That's easy pick real quick to add on to the uh, naming thing though. A certain sportsbook slash daily fantasy operator lists their name separately across their own products. So even on one website, they can't decide what this guy's name is. So be sure you're paying attention. Bet Igor, don't worry about his full name. Okay. That's that's confusing. That could be problematic, right? He He's officially, you know, on the UFC website, he's officially Igor Severino. And on most betting sites, he's Igor De Silva. So it's, it's very confusing, but the UFC is listing him as Severino. And Tapology has him as Igor Da Silva Severino. Okay. So. All right. Well, either way, like you guys said, uh, be mindful. He's only 20. <laughs> Maybe he's just like, he doesn't know what he wants in life yet at 20 years old. What it's, name he you know, wants it's, to it's one thing when uh, fighters get married and change their surname. And like, I get like, you know, the betting sites or the UFC not sure what to call them because the fans know them as one name. Like we couldn't just settle on one name. We couldn't settle on one surname. Yeah, it's it's uh it's tough, but uh just just be mindful. I mean, just it's he's the only Igor on the card, so I don't think it's gonna cause too much confusion. Okay, well, it's like when guys get traded or signed with a new team, and uh, the DFS websites or the betting sites have the the jersey he wore from like it's a, it's a headshot from like seven years ago, uh, or from like his previous team, and they just never updated it. So maybe it's they they look at it the same way. Anywho, all right, there you go. So there's a little pushback with some agreement on Severino or De Silva, whatever his name is. The Action Network podcast is presented by North Carolina's newest sports book, BetMGM. Use the bonus code ACTION when signing up to get $150 in bonus bets when you bet just $5. Four new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's go to props before we hit the best bet discussion uh, between the guys. They're going against each other there. Prop Zerillo, is this a good week for props? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I like this card for underdogs. I haven't dove too deep into the prop market, but basically a system prop play for me is fading Edmund Shabazian in rounds two and three. I think if fights were five minutes long, Edmund Shabazian and Marlon Marais would be world champions, but fights are at least 15 minutes long. And when they don't finish their opponents in round one, those guys both tend to fall off a cliff. In fact, Edmund Shabazian's brother also has like severe cardio disadvantages after round one. So it must be a genetic thing because they both fight very similarly and then fade very similarly in round two. I'm not a particularly big fan of A.J. Dobson. I think he's kind of overrated as a prospect, but he is super durable. And I think he's very likely to survive that first round and very likely to work his way back to the fight. And as Shabazian tires, I think Dobson carries enough power to hurt him and potentially get him out of there. So Dobson to win in rounds two or rounds three, plus, uh, plus 1,300 and plus 1,900 respectively. I mean, I would have expected... Even though he's an underdog, I still would have expected about eight to one and fifteen to one respectively at best. So definitely getting more value on those numbers than I would have expected. Shabazian is just a very reliable fighter to fade after seven and a half minutes. Maybe he makes it to a decision, but I think Dobson a good live bet after round one, and then I definitely want to share of his round two and round three props at plus money. Don't need to take big stabs there. Could even do you know point one or. 0.05 of a unit like just very small stabs but i think worth having something on dobson round two and round three and the one billy's going to talk about too I, I just think there's a big price discrepancy between the money line and the knockout prop so let him go ahead with that but uh, i think there's like definitely projected value based on the differential between the win probability and the the actual outcome so billy go ahead yeah speaking of fighting brothers who have not shown us much cardio in the ufc we have one of the tafas fighting we 
it's hard to keep track of which one because they keep subbing in and out for each other. This time it's Justin, the even bigger, more powerful punching Tafa. So now, he, now we're keep now we're keeping an eye on the first name. This is where we have to keep be mindful of names. Yeah, it's, it's Justin. Well, this one as long as I, I'd bet Junior Tafa almost the exact same way in this fight. <laughs> like you're gonna okay. get a Tafa. We're not sure which one's gonna show up in any given fight, but you know they do fairly similar things. Uh, Tafa is Justin is four and three in the UFC. None of his wins have gone longer than two minutes. He has two decision losses and then one finish loss. The finish loss was two minutes and 10 seconds. This He does one thing, right? He comes out, he swings heavy punches. If that doesn't work, that's pretty much it. Round one at BetMGM is plus 350. Um, there's books where you can make parlays of round one knockout. There's some books where you can get really picky and do like within the first minute or the first second minute. I believe BetMGM has those. I'm not going to get that cute just because he's finished them all in the first two minutes. Doesn't mean he can't pick up one at 208 or 303 or something like that. But yeah, you know, Sean was pointing out the discrepancy. He's slight underdog here, plus 150, plus 160 now. That's came down significantly. That should be so much closer to either his knockout prop or his round one prop. Either of those are fine, similar prices. I think round one's a little bit longer odds, so I kind of like that better. But yeah, however you want to play that or, you know, play them together pretty obvious and then if you want to play it on the safer side the finish only line for justin top is minus 115 those are bets that get refunded if it goes to a decision carl williams has been to a decision in all of his ufc or contender series fights just the total opposite game plan former 205 er coming up to heavyweight just looks to control fights and win minutes versus a guy who's just swinging for the fences and if it doesn't work it doesn't work so yeah structural play like sean was pointing out with shabazian same deal on the other fighting brother on this card yeah, I feel like uh, William. The most damage Williams lands is the takedowns. Like he doesn't actually throw any strikes at all in his fights. He's yeah. he's slamming people on the ground, and that's the most damage he's landing in the fight. So I think that finish only line is interesting. But to me, Williams also kind of has to fight a perfect fight for 50 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure Tapas carry power won't carry later into the fight. And if Williams is getting sloppy with these takedown shots or whatever, I think there's a chance that Tapa catches him. So to me, Williams almost has to fight like a perfect fight for 15 minutes mm-hmm. where Tafa only needs one. So I, I think, you know, not only the discrepancy between the money line and the knockout prop, but just also the stylistic nature of it. You're laying juice on Williams who has to like control him for 15 minutes and not let him get up and land one big punch. And yeah, I mean, even though Tafa hasn't won a fight outside of round one, I don't think it's, he's incapable of being on the feet again to start round two, right? After the opening bell and landing a knockout punch there and, maybe even doing it to start round three. So yeah, Williams massive grappling upside, but also like needs to not get clipped for 15 minutes. And that's almost sometimes harder to do than landing one. Okay. There's a lightweight fight in, on the prelim card. Uh, we've got Ogden and Hollabaugh and Billy has a right. I want to let Billy go first on this because yeah. you guys are, uh, we let Zerillo go first on the opposite sides of the spectrum. So Billy, I'll let you weigh in first on this. You think Ogden is the favorite is actually undervalued. And then we'll let Zerillo present the other side. Yeah. And it's very similar to my thoughts on the miles, John Cody Gibson fight where we have, you know, a guy coming in in Halibaugh's case, he won the last season of the ultimate fighter. He was another returning fighter. He went 0 four in the UFC, his first go around comes back in on the show. So he's officially one and four in the UFC but his only win was against another ultimate fighter contender who hasn't done anything else in the UFC. That doesn't really prove much to us. And then Ogden, much like Miles Johns, is coming in off a no contest that was clearly a win for him. He was up two rounds to nothing, had a submission on his opponent. The ref jumped in thinking the opponent was asleep. He wasn't. For whatever reason, I I truly don't understand this when it happens in the third round. They didn't go to the scorecards. They just called it a premature stoppage. These are important to watch because... There's been some where the submission really wasn't on and the guy was fine. And there's been some where it was like a matter of time and the ref saved him. This was option B. Like uh, Nicholas Mata was definitely going to go out from the arm triangle he was in against Trey Ogden. And I've thought Trey Ogden, his last few fights, one was a loss against Nacho Bahamundes. His only other UFC loss before that was a split. He's looked better and better each of his fights. He's not super young. He's 34, but he's the younger fighter here. Seems to be making improvements. Again, I wish I was getting a little bit better price on him, but minus 150, minus 145, whatever in there. And part of it is just structural for me is when we have a guy who looks like he hasn't won a fight in two-ish years, but really won his last fight, I think the market's going to be off on that just kind of by default. So that's the biggest thing for me, as well as the overvaluing of this last season of Ultimate Fighter, which was horrible. 
All right. And Zarillo, you're on 37-year-old Kurt Hollibaugh on the other side of the Ogden fight for a best bet. Yeah, I actually think Hollibaugh should be favored here. On the feet, Ogden, to me, is a leg kick merchant. He's won all of his fights by grappling. He's actually been submitted three times, but he's he's finished all of his opponents by submission, and I think he's going to get double or tripled up in terms of volume on the feet here. So if this fight stays standing, I think Hollibaugh beats the crap out of him. If they end up grappling, I think Hollibaugh is going to do a lot of scrambling and make it really difficult for Ogden to keep him on his back. So Ogden, to me, just isn't going to land the damage. I think he needs to submit Hollibaugh if he's going to win this fight. Hollibaugh is going to be landing sufficiently more damage, significantly more volume across 15 minutes of this fight. He's going to be the one applying forward pressure. He's going to be the one landing more volume, and I think he's going to be the one hurting his opponent. Hallbaugh's losses have actually aged incredibly well. He lost the yeah. three top 15 fighters in his division. Tiago Moises, Shane Burgos, when he was actually in his prime, and Ronnie Barcelos came back, went on the ultimate fighter, beat Austin Hubbard. Austin Hubbard has like a 500 record in the UFC. So, you know, Hallbaugh, I think, has kind of gotten underrated off of those losses and the fact that his first UFC run didn't really go very well, but those were extremely difficult matchups. Trey Ogden levels below either of those guys. So... The 37-year-old angle, definitely concerning. Once you get to that age in these lighter weight classes, you can fall off of a cliff at any moment. If he was fighting a 27-year-old or a 28-year-old, I'd be much more concerned. Ogden being 34, also on the wrong side of the age curve for the division, much less concerned about the age differential between these guys. Completely agree with Billy. I think Ogden has gotten much better in recent fights. Uh, I believe he's taken over as the head coach uh, of James Krause's mm -hmm. former gym, so I don't like know if you know, just being in the gym or like working as a coach has kind of changed his perspective on fighting and help round out his skill set better. But uh, I just don't think this is a particularly good matchup for him. I also think his, you know, he won as a big underdog against Daniel Zell Huber. That was more so to do with Zell Huber just staring at him and letting Ogden kick his leg for 15 minutes inside the apex cage. That was a very odd performance. So yeah, I, I think Ogden needs to grapple successfully in order to win this fight. I think there's a chance that he can, but I think Hallibaugh is very difficult to keep down and going to scramble a lot. And once they're on the feet, I think he's going to be in Ogden's face the entire fight. So this should be a fun one. Uh, I think it's likely that it goes to a decision. And I, I think both guys are pretty durable. And considering the volume for Halba, that's the side I want to be on a plus money. Billy, any further pushback? Or are you good? You got you understand the side? No, I, I get where he's coming from. And both of these fights that we disagreed on. I wasn't really looking too much at the technical side of things. I'm just trying to, I'm playing the market here a little bit more than the fights. Okay. And Sean's making good points with some of the technical stuff. Although again, I firmly disagree on the PED angle this year, now that we don't really test for those anymore the same way, but yeah, I, I get where he's coming from. It's going to be challenging, but Ogden has to have those big moments. So I think he can do that, you know, smaller cage, a little bit younger. Don't like betting on 37 year olds who need to like scramble and be quick just as a, as a guy getting up there in years who's still grappling myself, that gets harder and harder every year as you get older. Again, not the Trey Ogden super young, but yeah, I'm excited for both these fights. It'll be really interesting. I think both of these, to an extent, are going to really let us know what that last season of Ultimate Fighter really mm -hmm. was and whether it was, like I was saying, a step below the Contender Series or whether it was a legitimate, you know, these guys are close to UFC level and just needed their shot. So it'll be fun to have answers to those questions. Okay, gents, good stuff. You can find Billy and Sean individually in the free award-winning Action Network app. Find Billy's luck ratings right up and be sure to digest all the content before you make your decision. For Sean and Billy, Brendan Glasheen, we'll be back here next week on the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. Have a great weekend. 